Welcome to the Peter King Podcast. So this is going to be an interesting one. I'm here with my friend Paul Burmeister uh, from NBC Sports. You know Paul. Um, and we are going to go through my mock draft. We're not going to have a guest this week. We're going to go through the mock as we record this, it's close to midnight Eastern time on Sunday, and the draft is now four days away. But um, it was an interesting process to do the mock this year because I was out on the West Coast. As we talked right now, you see my Cal uh, outfit. <laughs> I'm actually in Berkeley. Uh, my daughter, one of my daughters lives here in Berkeley with her family. Uh, we spent a couple of days, a few days actually, up in Seattle visiting my grandson Peter and uh, Mary Beth and her family. Uh, and so it was, a, it was an interesting way to do the mock draft to tell everybody, uh, yeah, I'll see you in about three days. And sorry, I'm a little bit of an idiot now this week. But the problem is, Paul, with the mock draft, honestly, it's that we all take it way too seriously. You probably don't. And a lot of the people who read and do this, but, but I've always believed like, if you're going to put your name on something, you want to try to make it as good as you can. And I wanted to take one minute while I have my little glass of cab here, <laughs> you know, I wanted to take one minute and sort of explain to you at the end of this process, how weird, weird it was this year to do this mock draft. So I'll make three points about doing a mock this year. The first point is, and Paul, by the way, hello. How are you? I'm sorry to be rude. <laughs> <laughs> All good, Peter. I was going to tell you that you are bringing up bad draft memories for me with uh, that cow in Sydney there. They ended my career at Iowa in a bowl game, and they had two first-round picks uh, as rush ends, Regan Upshaw and I think Dwayne Clemens was the yes. other one. Those are names yeah. from way back when. Uh, but it's uh, it's only a sign of how much time has gone by that I can smile while talking <laughs> about the draft and the Cowboys. Where was it? Was it a bowl game? It was the it was the very first Alamo Bowl, the first one wow. down there in San Antonio. Yeah, long, long, long bad night for your for your co-host friend here. Wow, what a bummer. Well, yeah. I'll try not to bring up Cal too often. <laughs> My daughter's okay. going to be a grad student there here soon, but uh, nice. we'll we'll leave that uh, off to one side. <laughs> so here's what made this mock draft so difficult. I'm in such an odd year, okay? And a lot of you won't really realize or understand how mock drafts are done, but I'll tell you how they're done. You get say 12 to 14 GMs and you, which you, who you talk to pretty, uh, you know, pretty often. Okay. And you basically tell these GMs that, you know, essentially, uh, Hey, help me out on this mock and, and all this. So, um, but there were all, there are a lot of fairly new GMs at the top of the of the mock, okay? And a lot of GMs who, at least in my opinion over the years, who really are not sort of, uh, who, who really are very conservative and who really don't say very much about what they're going to do or what they've heard or anything like that. So that becomes an issue when you're trying to project what is going to happen in the draft. The fact that there's a lot of new GMs with high picks who are not used to sort of maybe doing the information exchange that mock draft people like me normally do. That's one thing. And I think the second thing is there's no we have to have this player player in this draft. There's no Trevor Lawrence. There's no Joe Burrow. There's not even a Kyler Murray in this draft. So to me, you've got to go back quite a few years. You've got to go back to like 2013 
when there was such basically an anonymous draft. Remember that, you know, EJ Manuel was the first quarterback picked at, at 16. So that makes it difficult. And I think the other part of it that makes it difficult, and this was said to me by one general manager about two weeks ago, he goes, listen, my top 20, the reason, this is a guy who had, a, who has a pick in the forties. And he was telling me that he goes, I think there's a very good chance that my pick, whoever I take at my pick in the forties, honestly, other people might take at 18 or 19. And that is one of the really difficult things about trying to forecast who goes where. That's what makes this so bad. And, and honestly, we're going to get into the mock in a moment. But it's just, I just, honestly, I've never guessed before. Hmm. Never guessed. This year, I guessed. A lot. Not a lot. I guessed on eight or ten. I, a, an educated guess, but honestly, Paul, a guess. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've been on this side, Peter. It's easy for me to smile because I'm never the one making the picks, but I've been the last 15 to 18 years, whether it's uh, Mike Mayock, Daniel Jeremiah, Charles Davis, or yourself, I always kind of feel the excitement and also a little bit of the angst because you guys want to get as many of these right as you can. And some years it's just super difficult. And I always say this, I think I said it last week, it's an exercise in 30, 45 minutes, an hour, an interesting draft discussion. Not about if you get four rights or 24 right or whatever. It's what's the logic? What's the thinking? What can you share about the thought process? And for people who are interested in the draft, it's a, it's a fun way to, to listen along and see what your team might do, not to be guaranteed what they will do. So that's, that's how I look at it. And that's how hopefully most people look at it too. I, I used a, a letter this week. I got to read it to you in my column. And I could have hugged this guy because most of the time when you, when you are talking about the mock draft, quite honestly, the thing that you hear is what an idiot you are. How did you not know that John Doe was going third overall? But listen to this letter. It's from a guy named Terry from Maine. <clears throat> Just one thing about your column with the stuff about the mock drafts. There's no such thing as a bad mock draft. They are all wonderful and interesting and sometimes silly. I look forward to yours, which along with all the others, I will have forgotten all about by next Sunday. And I say, I, I, I just said, you know, I love you. I love you. So Paul, the last thing I'll say before we get into it and I'll, We'll start, we'll do a few headlines on the mock. But the, the one thing that, and people all, like my wife always said to me, like tonight at dinner when I was, you know, my mind was a hundred places else or whatever that cliche is. My mind was not there. She goes, Peter, it's not real. And I said, I know it's not real. I know that, that I know that, but what's going to happen is that I have pride in my work. I want to do better than guys who I respect, like Peter Schrager and Albert Breer and Daniel Jeremiah and Mel Kuyper and, you know, and Matt Miller and, and Todd McShay, all, all these guys who do mock drafts who it's, you know, it's our job. And, <clears throat> you know, you really want to take pride in your work. I think it's no matter what it is you do, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, we'll end this part of it. And I'll, I'll just say that I think one of the things that is fun about it to me, it's maddening. And it's also fun is that Look, every day my wife and I sit, we're traveling now, so we haven't done it on this trip. Children have uh, intervened. But mostly at lunch every day in our apartment in Brooklyn, we sit down and we try. Early in the week, it's easier because the New York Times crosswords get tougher as the week goes on. 
we sit there around lunchtime and I have my little tuna fish sandwich on whole grain and she has her salad and we look at that day's New York Times crossword puzzle. This is a, a football crossword puzzle. You say, okay, if I'm going to give, um, you know, if I'm going to give Chris Olave, the receiver, to Washington, then that means I need to take the pick. I was going to give Chris Olave to Green Bay. I know that Green Bay likes Chris Olave. I was going to give him to Green Bay, but he's not going to be around that long. So now I have to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with Green Bay? <clears throat> so that is what, to me, is so interesting about it. It is the equivalent of a difficult New York Times, like Friday crossword to me. Spending a lot of good quality time with your wife makes me feel bad. In, in the mornings or at lunchtime, we're usually <laughs> doing our own separate things here, Peter. I should be taking notes from you. But um, I, I, to, to your point about what type of draft this is, there are certain things that we hear every draft season, no matter if it's 2013 or 2022, but you don't hear with sincerity Nobody knows anything and uh, what an unknown it is this year. And that's what makes it unique. No quarterback at the top. People really don't know what's happening in the top 10. So uh, a lot of these drafts can feel similar, but it's nice to have one, even though it's unknown for those of you doing the mock drafts. Uh, it, it is nice to have one where there's, I mean, nobody really knows. Um, so all the darts. Paul, the great the thing. Hey, sense. Paul, Paul, the yeah. great thing is I was talking to somebody from NFL network the other day. I said, I, I'm, I'm kind of ticked off at this draft because I don't know anything really. Right. And, but I said, if I were you, I'd be thrilled with it. It's going to be a great television show. Right. Because 10 times in that three and a half to four hour window on Thursday night, you're going to say, Oh my God, what well, Philadelphia just took whoever. And, and it's just that to me is fun. You know, not everything should be known. Right. Surprises are good. So we'll see what happens. You know, so let me tell you how I think we're going to, Paul and I are going to do this podcast. We talked beforehand and I said, maybe the best thing is for you to lead me and I can tell you what I want and then, or what I know rather, excuse me. And then, after we do that, you know, we go through a bunch of things, we will discuss a few trends in the draft or, you know, a few things in the draft that, you know, like, for instance, in this draft, I'll give you my three headlines in this draft, and then we're going to get into it. My number one headline is, I don't have Malik Willis in the first round. And I think that will be a surprise to people. And I think there's a good chance I'll be wrong. I just simply couldn't find a team that I thought was going to take Malik Willis. I didn't want to force a, fair, a square peg into a round hole, so I didn't put him in here. That's number one. Number two, I do not have a quarterback going until number 20 overall. That is totally unheard of. The first time this century, if it happens this way, and I have no idea if it will or not. But the first time this century that a quarter, the first quarterback in the draft would be picked that low. The third thing I believe it, that is interesting to me is that all of the receivers that you would think of as first round receivers, I have them all gone by number 18. Six receivers going in the top 18 and then there is a line of demarcation, a bold line, a gulf, a moat with the, you know, before you get to the other receivers. We'll talk about that, but I think those are kind of my, my three headlines that I got. And Paul, I'm going to ask you, take it away. You got it. And uh, like a lot of the fans out there listening, I want to know more about the Malik Willis not going, but it'll yeah. make sense. I will bring it back up at pick 32. When we get to 32, it'll make sense why we're bringing it up at that point. So uh, let's get it rolling. Uh, Jacksonville at number one. Peter has the Jaguars taking Trayvon Walker, defensive lineman, 
Georgia. Uh, a lot of edge players would make sense here. Why do you think Walker is the one? You know, I, I don't know for sure, but I was told here, and I quote, expect a surprise. And this was something that was said a couple of weeks ago when I think most people were still thinking it would be Aiden Hutchinson. And look, Trayvon Walker, you know, everybody looks at him like the guy with the huge upside, and I get it. He does have huge upside. He's also got nine and a half sacks in 29 games in college. And he was not an edge rusher all the time. Sometimes he played three technique. He got caught in the wash in the middle of the line. <clears throat> Sometimes he dropped into coverage. I have a really, really good video in my column of Trayvon Walker chasing down an Alabama runner in the national championship game that gives you some idea why people are in love with him. He's a really good, hard trying effort player all the time. I like Trayvon Walker, but it's a risk because he didn't have the production in college that Aiden Hutchinson had. Exactly. So if it is a surprise, and it would be if Walker goes number one at Jacksonville, no surprise at number two, Peter, that you have Aiden Hutchinson going to the Lions. The big thing is the Lions want to have guys on their team in their franchise, as I say, uh, <laughs> we have a downtrodden team and our ethos needs to be, we are not going to be downtrodden anymore. That's got to be the whole Dan Campbell ethos. And as one uh, GM told me last week, this guy is a perfect Dan Campbell player. And, you know, I think it's an easy pick. It's the only pick in this draft that I would go to Vegas and put 10 bucks down on. Honestly, if he's there at number two, I like him. And you know what's so funny, Paul? <clears throat> I wrote a note in this column that, uh, that if I heard this one time, I heard it 900 times. Hey, watch out for, uh, watch out for Kayvon Thibodeau here. And... I believe that the Lions have seriously considered the pass rush threat who is Kayvon Thibodeau. But again, I think we'll hear that a lot in the next few picks, but I think they're going to go Aiden Hutchinson. Yeah, little, little tease. Uh, we, we will not hear Thibodeau's name uh, inside this top 10. So here's how we're going to handle th these next series of picks. Uh, because starting at three with the Houston Texans, we're looking at teams at three, four, and five that have two picks in the top 10. So instead of going just chronologically, like having Houston go at three and then holding off to hear their next pick until they come up chronologically, we're just going to group these next three teams together. So with the Texans, the Jets, and the Giants, Peter's going to give both of his picks that he has them taking in the top 10 to kind of look at the entire team conceptually uh, instead of just one separated until we get to the next one. So beginning with the Texans at three, Peter's first pick, offensive line, Iki Ikuanu, tackle North Carolina State. And then he also has Houston trading up to nine with Seattle to get the wide receiver from Ohio State, Garrett Wilson. So Texans, offensive line and receiver, two in the top 10, Peter. Go ahead. I think what you have to realize when you're looking at Houston, and this is me reading tea leaves, because so often in this draft, Nick Casario is a, he's a sphinx about the draft. So you're not really going to get a lot out of Nick Casario. But I think what's logical to, to, to think is what you want is if you're Houston, you want to have players who you're picking in this draft who you feel confident are going to be cornerstone guys in 24, 25, and 26, okay? That is what this draft is about. Post Deshaun Watson, you want to build for the future. So you've got your choice, as I, as I see it, of any tackle in this draft. Iki Iquanu is very athletic. He's very strong. He's a dedicated, dedicated guy. And he's also a guy who 
Houston believes has positioned versatility, the left or right side. Eventually, they'll play him at left tackle, probably will start him at right tackle. But with Laramie Tunsil, uh, you know, right now, he's going to be 30 years old opening day 2024. And my next pick where I talk about a receiver, Brandon Cooks is going to be 30 years old on opening day 2024. The Texans need to plot for the long-term future. And that is what this draft is really about. So we go tackle at three, and I have them trading from 13 to nine with the Seattle Seahawks. And at nine, I have them taking Garrett Wilson, as you say. <clears throat> the reason why I think they are really smitten with Garrett Wilson is they believe that athletically, um, speed-wise, and productivity – that he's the best wide receiver in this draft. And they believe that long-term, he's going to be a guy who they want to build with, say, post Brandon Cooks. Now, could Brandon Cooks be on this team in 24? Yes. But <clears throat> they're talking about building a team, <clears throat> you know, 24, 25, 26, and beyond. These are going to be their two cornerstone players. Hey, look, I... I don't know this, but I believe that these two guys are guys who they would want to be their cornerstone guys going into the future. And Paul, let me say this. A lot of people will say, well, wait a second, Davis Mills at quarterback. The thing with Davis Mills that people don't realize, the last five games of the year, he went two and three. I put his stats in my column a few weeks ago. I wish I remember them, but they were really good the last five weeks of this season. They say, look, our quarterback this year, when he played, played better than the first pick in the draft. And so let's give him a real chance and let's see. And if he's not the guy next draft day or next next year in the draft, in round one, we'll do something about it. I thought it was one of the most underrated stories uh, the last part of the season last year that Davis Mills was really promising. If you... You, you don't have to say he was he was great or should have gone in the first round, but that was encouraging what he did. And I love the fact that you gave him a tackle and a wide receiver. Before we get to the Jets at four, just quickly, uh, Iquanu instead of Evan Neal from Alabama. Are, do, you, do you have any sense on, on how teams are feeling about that? You know, I've heard for a couple of weeks that people were concerned with Iquan, the wear and tear on Aquano. You hear this a lot of, or on Neil, excuse me. You hear this a lot of times about Nick Saban players and at Alabama, the veteran guys who've played a lot. And you hear sometimes that they enter the NFL kind of beaten up. Um, and I think there are some people who are concerned about uh, the status of Evan Neal, particularly of, of an old knee injury, but I was told coming into this weekend that, that about, I, I, I'm going to be wrong a little bit because I didn't add it up. There's about 24 or 25 teams in this draft that think that Evan Neal may not be pristine, but they would draft him. You know, his physical uh, health would not concern them. It, I don't think there's much of any concern about Aquanu uh, and his health. Um, and look, we're going to get to it in a minute when we talk about the Giants, but I think the Giants are going to have a very difficult decision between uh, Charles Cross and, and Evan Neal. As you said, we, we will get to that in a moment, but let's deal with the other New York team, the Jets at four, and then they also pick at 10. I think big picture for the Jets, when you think about these two picks they have early in the first round, you also have to consider they have two picks in the 30s. Uh, they're loaded in the third, fourth, and fifth round. So you have to, yep. I think, really put everything together or consider all the early picks they have when you think about their process at four and 10. But Peter has them at four, go on the cornerback from Cincinnati, Sauce Gardner. And then coming back at 10, uh, this is a really interesting pick uh, with the wide receiver from Alabama, Jamison Williams, who tore his ACL, unfortunately, in the national title game. So uh, corner and receiver, go ahead. See, I think with Sauce Gardner, the one thing that everybody always tells me about Joe Douglas, he wants a safe pick. Joe Douglas being the general manager of the Jets. 
And so Sauce Gardner obviously is safer than Derek Stingley. And everybody knows that Derek Stingley was great in 2019 and he did not have a good year in either 20 or 21, had a foot injury, Liz Frank in 21. So he really has not been great for three years. So everybody is saying, who is Derek Stingley? Gardner is a lot easier to project. 1,100 college snaps, never allowed a touchdown in one-on-one coverage. Um, and I think he is a perfect safe pick for Joe Douglas right there at number four. At 10, the way I look at this is that, so probably I would say maybe not half, but at least a third of the teams in this league believe that the number one receiver in this draft is Jamison Williams of Alabama. And everybody will understand that, geez, how how do you say that? Because he was... He was hurt in the national title game. He's not going to play much, probably not going to play much. I think his people have been telling teams that, oh, he'll be on the field by early October. Yeah, you know, I don't think if you're hurt on January 10th with an ACL that you can be sure that you're going to play at any level until, say, December. But we'll see. You know, different people respond to, <clears throat> rehabbing an injury in a different way. But this pick, just like we talked about Houston, Paul, this pick is about the future. The Jets know they're not beating Buffalo and probably not beat Miami or New England this year in their division. Not that they want to throw in the white flag, but this is a pick to me for opening day 2023. And I think I'm going to revisit what I said before I teach you up on this one, Peter. I think that having two picks early in the second round that if you look at four in the top 40 and you get to opening day and you have two or three starters from those top 40 picks, you can have that kind of patience with one that, okay, he's not going to be around till mid season or maybe late season. I think it gives them that kind of license if they do hit earlier and also with those two picks in the second round. Okay. Let's get to the giants. Now they also have two in the top 10 at five. You have them going offensive line. Interesting. You give them Charles cross from Mississippi state. And then at seven, they come right back with the safety from Notre Dame, Kyle Hamilton. I got to hand it to my friend, Peter Schrager of uh, good morning football and uh, a Fox and, you know, NFL network that, uh, he's the one who first put Charles Cross here. So my, my hat's off to him. But when I started asking about this, there's one thing everybody is going to say, well, look, you got Andrew Thomas, who's a classic left tackle. And so you want to take a guy who's going to have experience at right tackle, right? Evan Neal started 12 games in his Alabama career at right tackle. He's very comfortable there. Why not take, you know, Evan Neal. I had Charles Cross described to me by by one GM as sort of a Jonathan Ogden type, a power forward who uses his hands so well. And so when the Giants went to the Charles Cross's pro day uh, at Mississippi State in Starkville, one of the things that they wanted to do, they wanted to get some time with him to work on some right tackle drills and to just basically see can you do the stuff to your right that you can do to your left they were satisfied with that he could and look paul i am not saying here that i would put 10 cents down on charles cross being the guy but i do think everybody would say well geez you you got a good left tackle why not take the guy who's better suited to play right tackle like evan neal but what i was told is that the giants are satisfied with Charles Cross's play at right tackle. Back to back to one of my original points with you, Peter, when we we're talking about this draft, uh, just kind of in the abstract that, I mean, it's not so much about nailing where these tackles go, but it's about the logic. I think you could tee up 10 teams and they might all have these top three tackles rated one, two, three in different order. So yes. it's, it's a little surprising that you have Cross there instead of Neil. I don't think you would have to go too far, though, to find too many NFL teams that have different orders here with these top three. So, yeah, in fact, in fact, I'll tell you, Paul, 
I have Evan Neal going to Carolina instead of Kenny Pickett right after this. Right. And one of the things about Carolina, I still find that there's disagreement inside that organization about what they should do. Um, but disagreement like with uh, that the head coach and the GM? No, I think the head coach and the GM are okay with taking a tackle. They realize that they need to get right now. They need to get better on the offensive line or else whoever plays quarterback isn't going to have a chance. I don't think this is, and look, I'm going to say this a thousand times in the next half hour. I could be wrong here, but in my opinion, if teams are really sold on quarterbacks, they'd be flying off the board. They're not, they're simply not sold on quarterbacks. Paul on Sunday, uh, four or five hours ago, I had a general manager tell me, and I thought that this GM what, who studied all the quarterbacks because he needs one and he's not going to take one. And I said to him, are you down on the quarterbacks or are you just happy with the guy you have right now? And he goes, I realize that we need a quarterback this year or next. I get it. I know that. But there is not one quarterback of all the ones I studied this year who I believe at any time in in their career will be a top 12 NFL quarterback. Now, that is a damning statement right there. You know, so that is one of the reasons why I don't have a quarterback go until 20. And and again, I'm going to say it a thousand times. I could be wrong here. I. I broke our rules here for a second. So we got Evan Neal going to Carolina and not Kenny Pickett. Right. And at number seven, because we were doing this theme of the teams that have two picks, I got the Giants taking Kyle Hamilton, <clears throat> the safety from Notre Dame. And one of the reasons that a lot of people might say, hey, wait a second. They got Xavier McKinney, played really well last year. They got a new defensive scheme a new defensive boss in uh, Wink Martindale coming in from Baltimore. So wait a minute. Why are you picking another safety? Probably going to lose James Bradbury at corner. Why don't you take a corner here? Why don't you take you whatever? And what I was told about this is you need to keep one thing in mind. That Wink Martindale loves to use his safeties in multiple ways. And he could have a safety on first down playing middle linebacker. He could have a safety playing a boundary corner position. He could have a safety just playing regular too deep. He, so his safeties, and they're going to blitz, his safeties are going to do everything. And that's one of the reasons why over the years, you've seen a, when wherever Wink Martindale was, you see safeties. Hey, I'd like to go play in that scheme. You know, so that's one of the reasons I think it's healthy to have Xavier McKinney and Kyle Hamilton in one defense. Makes sense there, Peter. And I I saw Kyle play every single game of his college career. And if there's a safety in this class or in any recent class who's comfortable mixing it up in the box uh, and also changing direction and covering a lot of ground in the back end, whether it's as a, as a, one of a, one of two safeties back there in a cover two or playing center field, he can truly do it all. He loves contacts and his change of direction and instincts on the ball are wonderful. So um, it's hard for me to argue with that pick there at number seven, let's go to number eight where you have Drake London wide receiver from USC going to the Atlanta Falcons. And this really begins the run of wide receivers. I think you have four going in a row. Remember you had Houston trading up there at nine to take Garrett Wilson. So Atlanta with its choice of any wide receiver for the first one off the board goes Drake London. So Drake London is a polarizing prospect. Everybody likes him. There's no question about it, but you know, the only 40 times you get on Drake London are estimates. You know, because he didn't run a 40 this year. Remember, late last October, he broke his ankle for USC. What I find, I mean, think about this. Drake London played eight games last year. 
He averaged in those eight games, 11 catches, 136 yards and a touchdown. I mean, those are absurd numbers, especially when you're playing in a power five conference and everybody knows the ball is coming to you. And as I say in my column, that what's interesting about, and I feel sorry for Atlanta because they have really, really good people running that show, you know, and Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot, but they've got a lot of work to do. And everybody, I think, is going to look at this and say, boy, they should have taken Malik Willis, should have taken a quarter, uh, a quarterback. And, you know, what about Kayvon Thibodeau? They have nobody to rush the passer. And as I say in my column, if they lined up today to play a three receiver formation, the three guys would be Zacchaeus, Auden, and Bird. You know, and 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 they've just got a long way to go at the receiver position to be really good. You know, I, Paul, let me just get into the, the other two guys I picked. Obviously, you got Garrett Wilson at nine. You got Jameis Williams at 10. And then with Washington's pick. So I believe Washington's number one guy was Drake London. And, uh, you know, obviously they didn't get him. They didn't draft him uh, I, in my mock. Um but the one guy who I really wanted to save for a particular team, I wanted to save Chris Olave for the Green Bay Packers and for Aaron Rodgers, but I just couldn't do it. Washington desperately wants a receiver in this draft. And Olave, to me, to me, is the last of the four premier receiver prospects, uh, you know, to, to be in this draft. So great football IQ, incredibly disciplined root runner. Um, and, you know, look, assuming Washington can keep Terry McLaurin, I don't know who's going to be their quarterback in 2021. I'm sorry, 2022, 23, 24. Carson Wentz got all the chance in the world to, to do this, but this is a team that is going to have skill positions to win with this year and in the future if they take a receiver like Alave at 11. Right. Four wide receivers in a row there. London to the Falcons, Wilson to the Texans, Williams to the Jets, Olave to the Commanders. Bringing us to number 12, kind of a lightning rod. I mean, people have strong opinions about this pick for the Vikings. So at 12, cornerback LSU, Derek Stingley. If he would have come out after his freshman year, which he which he didn't have the option, probably would have been a top five pick. Injuries, wide range of film the last couple of years, people wondering if this mega talent will go in the teens. You have him 12 to the Vikings. Here's the thing about Derek Stingley and Minnesota. Minnesota has targeted him from day one, I believe. Um, you know, Quasi Adolfo Mensa, um, the new general manager, has really felt strongly about trying to upgrade the secondary intelligently. Their secondary coach this year is was the defensive coordinator at LSU last year, Durante Jones. And, you know, the veteran mentor guy on this defense right now is Patrick Peterson. So another LSU corner. And so if you think about it, I mean, they got his old coach and they've got a mentor who uh, anybody would like. And I know Patrick Peterson pretty well. This is a great teacher of the game. He reminds me so much of Tyron Matthew. You know, he's just, he just wants to make people around him better. Of course, he wants to be great too, but he will give you every last drop of his knowledge. And to me, I think Derek Stingley is going to be in this draft. I think Derek Stingley in this draft is going to be the best player. Wow. I just do. I love the fit right here. 
I love the fact that he has been aiming for this his whole life, his whole family and all this. Well, you know, and you'll read a lot about this, but I love Derek Stingley. And I think this is a great pick by Minnesota and Stingley, if they get him, if Minnesota gets him, there could not be a player going to a more perfect situation. So many intriguing questions about defensive players. I mean, the first one you had off the board, Trayvon Walker to Jacksonville, people wondering about, well, why wasn't there more production for somebody this good? And there's a lot of questions about Stingley with why was his tape not that great the last couple of years? Why wasn't the effort always there? It can't be all injuries, can it? So um, this is really such a wide range of opinions on him, but there are people who believe in the talent just as much as you do. Another interesting one at 13. Now, remember, Seattle did have nine. You had them in a trade with Houston. So dropping back to 13, you had the Seahawks going. Kayvon Thibodeau, edge rusher, Oregon. Look, this, this, is a, this is a huge story in and of itself. You know, as, as a general manager told me, you know, I, I had finished most of this and I was running through a few picks for three or four general managers today, Sunday, late Sunday. And um, one of them said to me, Thibodeau at 13 would be a coup for Seattle, you know, or really for anybody at 13. And I'll tell you, I think Pete Carroll will love to coach and to have Kayvon Thibodeau, a guy who everybody has doubts about. He'll love having him in the building because a lot Pete's going to say to his team, people have doubts about us. Pete is one of these us against the world guys. You know, he always has been. He's always a guy who is going to be going to use what he's going to feed off what he can use in the public sphere. And um, but I want to tell you a couple of things, Paul. There's a team in the top five who spent 70 minutes yesterday on a Zoom call with Kayvon Thibodeau. And this just illustrates everything about this draft. Six days, five days before the draft, you're not spending 70 minutes on a Zoom call with Kayvon Thibodeau if you're not serious about possibly drafting him. You just don't do it. And so... Kayvon Thibodeau is a really, really interesting player in this draft. And I think, I'm not saying he's going to go 13. I don't know where he's going to go. I'm projecting him going here to Seattle. But there's a lot of teams that are doing every bit of last second due diligence on him. It, it makes me wonder all these weeks and months later, Peter, what are they still hoping to find out 70 minutes of a Zoom call in? What they're trying to find out is basically that they have a lot of questions about Kayvon Thibodeau. And they have a lot of questions about whether is this selfish player? Is this a guy who cares more about his brand than, um, than about football? And I think, you know, this reminds me of a story in 2017 when I covered the <clears throat> 49ers on draft weekend. And there was, a re there was a running back named Joe Williams who Kyle Shanahan wanted. The rest of the organization thought he had too many red flags about him. And John Lynch spent 30 minutes on the phone with him, you know, the day of the draft trying to figure out can I get comfortable with this guy? And it turns out that they did end up picking him. He didn't succeed. But I just think a lot of teams, it's like, hey, Paul, remember when you had a final in college and, you know, your final was on Monday and that gave you all weekend to study for it. And if you're really if you really were serious about school, you were going to take every minute of time to prepare for this test to make sure you did absolutely as good as you can. And I think it's the same way with this. If NFL teams were told that the draft is on March 24th, 
they would be ready on March 24th. But if you've got all this extra time, they're going to use it. And I think that's what's going on with Kayvon Thibodeau. Bringing us to number 14, the Ravens go offensive line, Trevor Penning tackle Northern Iowa. I think the Ravens have three or four guys. I think as we sit here uh, very late Sunday night, clock almost turning to Monday, there's a lot of, I think there are four or five players who Baltimore would consider strongly here. Here's the reason about Trevor Penning. So last year, you know, when Ronnie Stanley was hurt at left tackle and they really didn't have a fixture at right tackle and plugging in Alejandro Villanueva, who has since retired. This is a team that needs a healthy long-term tackle. And that's why I gave Baltimore Penning. And I do think, I really think that if you've got a guy, even though Northern Iowa is not Alabama, this guy started 31 games at left tackle. He's six seven. He's a basketball player. He's what a left tackle needs to be right now. I don't know. I I think this, if I were Baltimore, this is exactly who I'd pick. Philadelphia at 15, Peter. Th- th- this is a, a player because of his uh, m- immense talent, literally and figuratively. I, I think he ends up going somewhere before 15. There are plenty that uh, believe there are reasons that he'll be around after this, but Eagles at 15, Jordan Davis, defensive tackle, Georgia. You know, Paul, this is another, another situation where, you know, like Howie Roseman, the GM of the Eagles is so difficult to read because, you know, as we sit here right now and the clock is turned into Monday, I'm telling you, Howie Roseman, if he is asleep right now, uh, he's dreaming of a trade partner to come up to 15 to blow him away with an offer. And that's that's what Howie does. And I think Jordan Davis is huge here because Fletcher Cox getting up there in years, he's going to be 32 in December. I think one of the things that you want to do if you're the Eagles Under Andy Reid, when he coached there for so long, he used to preach inside the organization the two most important things, offensive line, defensive line. And right now, with Fletcher Cox getting up there, and maybe this being his last year, they need an heir to Fletcher Cox. And Jordan Davis, at 335, 340, whatever he is, running four, seven, eight in the 40, being very athletic. This is a perfect guy for Philadelphia. Philadelphia will pick again at 22, bringing us to the Saints at 16. They'll also pick again coming up at 19. But with their first pick, Peter, uh, you have them taking the wide receiver from Arkansas, Traylon Burks. I think New Orleans wishes they've, they had a better pool of receivers to choose from. But this... I. I think one of the things we need to realize about New Orleans, because I think a lot of people say, why'd they make that trade with Philadelphia? We talked about this a little bit last week on the podcast. This team right now, the New Orleans Saints, in the last four regular season games, they've played Tom Brady. They've The, the Bucks the last two years, they've had Brady. They played him four times. They have the New Orleans Saints are 4-0 against Brady, and they've won by 11, 35, 9, and 9 points. The Saints have not played a one-score game against the Bucs, and they're 4-0 against them. Now, obviously, in their playoff game, <clears throat> they turned it over a bunch, and they lost. Tampa Bay won the game. And I'm not here to, to argue about who's better or anything of like that, but I'm saying internally the saints think they're better than the bucks they just do and there's four games of evidence to suggest that they might be and now they've lost breeze one year peyton the next year and i believe that making this trade for the second pick in the teens is not about going up and getting a quarterback it's about making your team the best it can be 
for this year. Their second pick here, I got him taking Devontae Wyatt, the defensive tackle from Georgia. And my whole theory on this is, can you imagine how happy Cam Jordan is going to be with a mountain who is a three technique type player in the middle of the line? It's going to extend his career, which has been a great career in and of itself. But I just think if they get a really good player on the front seven, and a good wide receiver, the Saints are going to walk away happy. Peter, it's either too late or I've been thinking too much about these USFL games I'm calling because you said two nine-point games are not a one-possession game. I'm like, wait a second, nine-point is a one-possession game, but this this is the NFL. So yeah, yeah. we will proceed, we'll, we'll proceed with the draft. So it's 17, LA Chargers, and this makes sense, Peter. You have them going cornerback, Trent McDuffie from Washington, because the way they've invested money, the way they've gone about their business in the offseason free agency, uh, making that defense better has been priority number one. Can you imagine if they line up on opening day and they're three corners and they're one of them playing the nickel, J.C. Jackson, Asante Samuel, Trent McDuffie, and look, McDuffie's the third best corner in this draft. And I know Dane Brugler, who I respect a lot, who does the, uh, the, the, a really big guide every year. He has him the second best corner in the draft. So this is a guy who is clearly a mid round, a mid first round pick. If they get him as the third best corner in this draft, they are going to be able to play. Patrick Mahomes and Russell Wilson and Derek Carr, who they, you know, by the way, you know, everybody said, oh my God, another corner for McDuffie. They just spent a jillion dollars getting JC Jackson. Don't you understand? 70% of the snaps in the NFL right now, 70% are played with three corners on the field. That's a starting player right yep. now. 100%. So don't think that that's some luxury. That's a necessity, yeah. <laughs> you know, anyway, whatever. It's so true. And you, and you also have to have one or two that can play in the slot. So you, you have yeah. more of them on the field and they, I, I think the, um, their diverse talents are needed more than ever as well. A couple moments ago, Peter, you said that Howie Roseman is dreaming about a, a trade partner, someone who wants to come up. We have it here at number 18. Uh, you have the Eagles trading with the Packers uh, Eagles trading the 18th pick to green Bay for the 22nd and a late third round pick, you say 92 overall, uh, but the pick for Green Bay, wide receiver Penn State, Jahan Dotson. Look, there's a lot of people in this draft who are smitten with Dotson, not because he's some great physical talent, because he isn't, but because he's got great hands and he's a fairly precise root runner. And he started 38 games in the Big Ten. This guy's going to walk into Green Bay and be ready to play. My whole thing about the Packers is I think they want a day one contributor at wide receiver for Aaron Rodgers. And one of the reasons is you say, well, geez, they went out and got Sammy Watkins. Can he be a bridge? can be a bridge but Sammy Watkins you can't count on him health-wise you just can't so to my to to my way of thinking I think that Jahan Dodson is the last receiver in this draft who I trust can make a big impact in September Green Bay Packers taking a wide receiver in the first round Peter that'll be uh, a giant wow we have we've not seen that for for a long time okay so Let's jump ahead now. 19, you already told us the Saints with their second pick in the first round uh, will we'll take Devontae Wyatt, defensive tackle, Georgia. Now to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And maybe they regret not taking a quarterback from Pitt many, many years ago, but you have them at yeah. number 20, selecting Kenny Pickett from Pitt. Look, I mean, I, I wrote about a little bit. I wrote about this a little bit, but in 1983, the Steelers were on the clock and they picked a defensive tackle named Gabe Rivera, who tragically uh, was paralyzed in a car accident. Um, you know, either the off season after that, or maybe one after that, but soon after he was drafted, he was paralyzed. 
So I, I don't mean to make light of that in any way, shape or form, but there were, there were a lot of people in and around Pittsburgh when their pick came up in the 1983 draft. Oh my God, we're going to get Marino. And they took a defensive lineman instead. And this was at the time when everybody knew we got to get somebody to replace Terry Bradshaw. So they didn't do it then. And I have them doing it now with another pit quarterback, Kenny Pickett. And a lot of people would say, what about Malik Willis? Mike Tomlin was, you know, was all over Malik Willis at his pro day, went out and had wings with him, uh, you know, at a restaurant and, you know, is all over Malik Willis. Could be. I, I mean, I'm I'm not saying I'm I'm sure that this is gonna be, but I do think that there's some evidence, some indication that the Steelers are Kenny Pickett people. And we'll see on Thursday whether that's the case or not. I do think that, you know, regardless of <clears throat> what happens in the first 19 picks, if this draft were to go exactly Pittsburgh's way, they would take a quarterback and they would take the quarterback that they wanted. And obviously I've got no quarterbacks going in the top 19. So uh, they will have their choice of quarterback at number 20. A lot, a lot of thoughts on this one here, Peter. Um, first of all, um, Kenny Pickett to me, the, the way that things I've read, things I've seen when I watch him, when I talk to people I trust, he's described it in this complimentary way, the way you would describe a really quality backup quarterback in the league that you were excited to have on your team in the sense that he's really experienced. He's really smart. He's really tough. If he has to play right now, he's going to do a good job. And those are all compliments, but I don't know if it's a first round quarterback. If, if, if yeah. we look at the ones who have really succeeded, who have come through in the first round and they're not these ones that we're still wondering about, or that we're ready to say that was a failure pick <laughs> talking about Herbert Burrow, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, they all had some kind of elite trait that showed up once they got experience in the NFL or even before they had a lot of games. And I don't know if Kenny Pickett has an elite trait that's going to allow him to be one of these first round success stories. Maybe he is just so smart, so tough, so accurate, all these other things that he will be. But if you look at the quarterbacks who really, you look back and you say, that was a great pick in these last four or five years. They had something that was really elite about them, and maybe that'll come out with Kenny Pickett right now, but it feels like Malik Willis has more of an upside there to have some kind of elite thing come out in these next couple of years with the way he can throw it and the way he can run. Uh, so it's a safe pick. It's probably the safest quarterback pick, uh, but I, I'm not as sold as some other people right now. I'm not sold at all. I mean, <laughs> I, I look at this as... Um, what is the guy who the Steelers feel best about today? Yeah. And I wish I could tell you with absolute surety that it is Kenny Pickett. I can't, in my opinion, this is a player who they believe has got the best chance to play and play at a high level in a tough division early. And we'll see what happens. You know, it's like so many people who I have, uh, who I've been involved with in talking about this. Paul, I've never heard difference of opinion about quarterbacks the yeah. way I've heard it this year. Really? Never. And so, you know, we'll see what happens. All, uh, all hands will be played by the end of the day Friday. And I say that because Friday is when the second round will happen. Bringing us to the Patriots at 21, Peter. And there are always, every time I do a mock with somebody, that there's always a name that shows up that I'm like, haven't, I've not seen this one yet. So New England, tackle Central Michigan, Bernard Raymond, Raman? Raymond from Central Michigan, yeah. There you He's go. He's an Austrian kid who was an exchange student his junior year in high school in Michigan, played football, and actually was a receiver in football and then went back home, 
completed his senior year in high school in Austria. And then Paulie was totally smitten with football. And the amazing thing is he then had to do six months of military service in Austria. And, but he never lost his love of football. And, and so he, because of how well he played in his one year in, uh, in the States, he got offered a scholarship by Central Michigan to come and play tight end. But soon he was actually put at tackle and his last year and a half, he played left tackle, played well. And obviously this is a guy for Bill Belichick who, you know, as G- Daniel Jeremiah told me, he goes, this, this is a Sebastian Vollmer pick. Remember Vollmer is the guy who 14 years ago, whenever it was, was picked in the second round by new England, ended up playing in two Super Bowls, and, you know, was a, was a good tackle. Uh, and he's a German guy. So, you know, the Patriots are one of those teams that they don't care where a guy comes from. They're just going to try to take him. And again, Paul, I don't have great tentacles into New England with this other than to say they know they got to address their offensive line. You and everybody else feeling that way about uh, not having tentacles into New England. Okay, so Philadelphia 22, remember you had them trading with Green Bay back. And let's also keep in mind, you had them selecting Jordan Davis in the teens, defensive tackle Georgia. So with the 22nd pick, Eagles, Devin Lloyd, defense again, linebacker Utah. In an ideal world, they want to go receiver here. But it's just like a bunch of these teams coming up. Paul, I got Devin Lloyd going to Philly. I got Jermaine Johnson, the edge rusher from Florida State, going to Arizona. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of teams now that would love to get a receiver. But you just really are going to have to, are going to, have to pull from the depths of the second round. And I think that is one of the issues. How many receivers do you love in this draft? And in my opinion, I think there are a few that would be worth it at the end of the first round. We'll get to them. But I do think that there are teams that really want a receiver that basically are going to say, I got priced out of the market here. Makes sense. All right, Dallas, uh, you mentioned you had Arizona going uh, Jermaine Johnson, edge rusher, Florida State. Cowboys have had success going offensive line in the first round. And here you have them selecting center from Iowa, Tyler Linderbaum. My next three picks are all offensive linemen for various reasons. Number one, Dallas, Linderbaum, center, Iowa. I cannot find anybody who, when I mentioned Tyler Linderbaum, you know, you all, everybody says, oh my God, love that guy. The only problem is, position inflexibility. He was only a center at Iowa. So you can't assume that he's going to play guard if you need him to play guard at some point. Buffalo Zion Johnson, the guard center at Boston College. You know, to me, I think if you ask any team what they want out of an offensive lineman, they want experience. And then I think secondarily, they'll want versatility. How about Zion Johnson? 36 starts at guard, 13 starts at left tackle. I mean, Zion Johnson is a great prospect, intelligent guy, great. I got him going to Buffalo. And again, Buffalo may not need him this year, but long-term, he's a perfect, interior lineman to build around and then you know my third straight uh offensive lineman tyler smith tulsa uh the tackle look you know if you are john robinson the general manager of the of of the titans you're gonna have a you're gonna be a little spooked toward the end of the round when you start thinking about isaiah wilson you know, the, the, the tackle they picked a couple of years ago, late in the first, who ended up absolutely, totally, unequivocally flaming out. You can't let that dictate. You can't let that rule what you're going to do. 
And since they lost Jack Conklin in free agency to Cleveland, they have needed a long-term right tackle and maybe need a long-term left tackle because obviously, you know, their, their left tackle right now is sort of Taylor Lawan. He's going to be 31 in July and he's getting, you know, you got to, you got to move on at some point. So I think those three offensive linemen in a row are interesting. At Tampa Bay at 27, Peter, last year, they also selected an edge rusher out of Washington in the first round. And now you have him going edge rusher again, David Ajabo from Michigan. The Ajabo pick is interesting because there are three or four teams that have really been doing due diligence on Ajabo. So sort of an incredibly sad story when he tore his Achilles at his pro day. But I'll tell you, he's got a lot of teams that are really interested in him. Whether it be late one, high two, I don't think he's going to last past 40. And I think Tampa loves him because in part, you know, you've got, you, you haven't signed Jason Pierre Paul back, but you've also got Shaq Barrett going to be 31 uh, next year. Um, and a young guy, Joe Tryon Shavanka, Shoyinka, excuse me, um, showed well last year. And I think this would be, everything is about now with Tampa, but to me, this would be about the long-term future. I want to just tell you one other weird slash surprising thing. I got Green Bay at 28 taking Arnold Ebikite, who's an edge rusher from Penn State, I saved you from pronouncing his name right there. And, <laughs> and, and the, thing, the thing that's interesting about this is I think this is a place that I could see the Green Bay Packers saying essentially that, okay, if, if we really need to move up to get a great receiver and we love a receiver in this draft, let's say we love Chris Olave and we need to go up to – 10 or whatever, I wouldn't be surprised if they package 22 and 28 to go up to get a guy they love. I don't think they'll do that. It's not really a Gutekunst thing, but it's interesting to, to, to uh, hold in the back of your mind. Another team now here in the first round, Peter, with multiple picks, Chiefs back-to-back, -back, 29 and 30. 29th pick, Christian Watson, wide receiver, North Dakota State. <laughs> and at 30, other side of the ball, Lewis Seen, Safety, Georgia. Look, Kansas City is bold. I would bet that one or both of these is going to be wrong because Brett Veach has always, along with the support of Andy Reid, said, let's move up. Uh, let's go get the guy we really want. I don't know who they really want. I will not be surprised if they trade up to – 9, 10, 11, using both of their first-round picks and whatever else they have to use to do that because they are not going to be stuck in the mud on something like this. I like Watson. He's a big 6'4 receiver, sub 4'4", 4, 440. Lewis Seen, of, you know, so, Paul, at the end of my discussion with all these GMs, I say, who have I not put in the first round who you really like? who you think should be in the first round. Lewis Seen won. He won. Five different GMs mentioned him about, you know, who I think should be in the round who I hadn't talked about. And so I ended up for, forcing Lewis Seen into the end of the round because I now think he's going to be a first round pick. Love your pick at 31, Peter. I, I loved last year when the Bengals took Jamar Chase. That was kind of an obvious one, but pairing him up with Higgins and Boyd, I thought was wonderful. So now the Bengals at 31, you have them selecting a tight end from Colorado State, Trey McBride. Look, last year they lost CJ Uzoma, who uh, played 965 snaps in their Super Bowl run. And when they signed Hayden Hurst in free agency, I think they signed him as a contributing player. They didn't sign him as a guy they think is going to play 950 snaps. And in my opinion, 
McBride has been a war horse. Now it's not the biggest level of college football. He caught 90 balls in a run first offense at Carolina State. Or I'm sorry, Colorado State. And I think that he's got the ability not to make them forget, you know, Uzoma, but um, I think he's got the ability to, you know, to, to be a guy who can be a quality replacement for him. Final pick of the first round, Peter, you, you have finished with some, some real life here at 32. You have Atlanta uh, trading with Detroit to get back in and to take the second quarterback of the first round, Matt Corral, Mississippi. The one thing I've thought all along is that somebody's going to trade to the lower part of the first round, at least one team to try to get a quarterback. And the reason is that then you get the fifth year with that quarterback. Potentially you don't have to, but you have the ability to exercise the fifth year option and to keep him around your team. He's in your control for five years. If you're Atlanta and you like Marcus Mariota, and maybe he plays a year, maybe two, then you can put in a guy. Now, Matt Corral has been a guy who Atlanta has expressed, you know, internally some interest in. I'm not saying, I, I look, I will not be shocked if Malik Willis either goes in the first, in the near the end of the first round, or is a team trades up into the end of the first round to take Malik Willis. But these are the two guys, Malik Willis and Matt Corral, who I think have a chance to go low in the first round. However, you know, I do think that it just says everything about where we are at the, uh, at the quarterback position this year. There's a huge disparity of opinion, and I just think there's not enough people who really view that the quarterbacks this year are the answers. In a way, it is the perfect snapshot of all the conversations that we've had, that we've heard these last two or three months about the quarterback position, that you finish with the quarterback and with only two going in the first round after you had Kenny Pickett at 20 to the Steelers. Uh, Vegas says the, the number for the over-under is two and a half on quarterbacks. I would take the I over. I think it's smart. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a really intriguing number. Uh, it fits, and it's one you really have to think about. I think it'll be three. I think Malik Willis and whether it's Corral or Desmond Ritter will also go, uh, but kind of finish where we started here. There are, there are different kinds of intrigue in this year's draft and the quarterbacks, will there be one, two or three and who will they be? Um, it's, um, it, it's a perfect way to end because it's something that we've thought about a lot here these last few weeks. Paul, listen, thanks so much for joining me and for going through the, I mean, I don't know who in the world can, listen to 70 minutes of me saying, well, I don't really know what's going to happen here, but, but anyway, I appreciate everybody listening. We'll be back next week with a podcast wrapping up uh, this draft, this draft of mystery men of intrigue. And I think it's going to be really a lot of fun. As I said to uh, one of the network people who are doing these, I said, this is, if you guys get a bad rating, it's your fault because, yeah, you don't have big stars, but you know what you have? You have mystery. And that, to me, is what's going to be fun about this draft. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast this week. Please go read my column, Football Morning in America, at NBCSports.com and at ProFootballTalk.com. We will talk to you and see you again next week. And Paul Burmeister. Thanks so much for staying up late on a Sunday night. It's past midnight where you are. And uh, I really appreciate your dedication and helping me out. Got it, Peter. It's not very often I'm up this late, so it uh, must be a special occasion. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.